Well, hey, it's Mr. Sorensen, and today, for our machine of the day, we're going to look at the router table. Well, today we're going to look at the router table, and as you can see here in the camera view, we've got, we actually have four router tables, plus we have a whole handful of handheld routers. So the router is actually a really big player as we build stuff in a wood shop. Um, which is why we need right four router tables. There are there are no other machines in the shop where we actually have four of them. But we use routers so much that it's very hard to work without this many. In fact, we could probably use several more. About the only machine in the wood shop I think that we could use this many of would be the table saw. We could probably use four or five table saws as well because the router and the table saw get the bulk of the work. So the routers, let's, let's refresh our memory, the routers are used to put a decorative detail on the edge of a board, plus a whole myriad of other things. So today we'll look at all that. To start with, I want to point out that um, last semester we looked at the handheld router, and I showed you that in use as I routed a board that was clamped to a bench. That's one way to route material. But that is a, it's a less safe way, right? Because I'm holding the router in my hand, that router bit spinning is just right there. If anything goes wrong, there's really nothing to stop the router from falling on me and getting caught up in my clothes and, and hurting me, right? We wanna, whenever possible, we wanna use a router table because it's far safer than holding the router in your hand and trying to route stuff. Now, one, two, three, four, behind me there are four big router tables, but at the heart of those four router tables is just a handheld router, right? These are, these two are store-bought router tables. These are shop-made router tables, but the same thing is true of all four of them. They all contain a handheld router that we've just mounted to the inside of the table and we raise the router bit up through the tabletop so that it is exposed. And then there you have a, um, a router table that you're able to route with. A router table is sort of the modern day version of a of a shaper, right? A shaper. Shapers are big, powerful, very dangerous. So the router table kind of takes that place. It's a much smaller motor. It's a, it's a, it's a far less likely to throw the piece of wood out of your hand across the, the room. Well, at the heart of every router table, or at least most router tables, is gonna be a tool panel. And I've mentioned to you before when we looked at other machines, one of the things that's, that's very, very helpful in any shop is to make sure you create a tool panel for every single machine so that all the tools necessary for that machine are right there at your disposal. Otherwise, you, whenever you get ready to, to do some work on the router, you have to go try to search for all this stuff and figure out where you last put it down. So uh, on the two store-bought models, they, they have a tool panel that looks very much like this. And on here are some really key parts. Um, first of all, there is a, a crank handle, and this is going to raise the router bit. Once I get my router, my chosen router bit in this router table, this raises and lowers the router bit to the exact height that I want so that I can use it. So there's a crank handle. There are some throat plates. Throw plates indicate to me, oh yeah, we're gonna have to change a blade and then we have to close up the space around the blade. Right, so notice the throw plates sit on here and there's pretty, they're pretty extreme, right? So here's one, you can barely see the hole. So there, there will be small router bits that will stick through there. And then here's another one with a giant hole. Um, and in fact, there are some router bits where I might not even be able to put any throw plate in. I just have to use it the way it is because the router bit is so big. So you have to kind of search through these to find the exact throw plate needed. Once you've put the router bit, the desired router bit in, you got to find the right throw plate. Now to remove the throw plate, in this case, it threads on like a, a nut, threads on a bolt. So here's the wrench, right? It's a clear plastic wrench. It's got two little pieces that stick out, and those two little pieces stick in the two holes that are on here that you see, right? This, this uh, throw plate is hanging on two nails. There's two holes in it. These two little pieces that project right here are gonna stick in those holes, and you loosen or tighten it with this little wrench. Ah, an important part of every machine is a safety guard. So all of the back here have an orange safety guard. 
that needs to be in place over that router bit unless you've been given permission by the instructor to remove it. Right? Anytime we can put a guard on a machine, we're far less likely to get injured. And so uh, our rule is without the teacher's permission, you do not use the machine without the guard on it. Um, there's just only a few situations where it, you need to do that. Um, so all of them should have a guard either on the tool panel or it's already on the machine. Obviously, we're going to have to change some router bits. So there should be a pair of router wrenches hanging on the, the tool panel so that when we are ready to put a new router bit on, we have those at our disposal. And then, right, then down here at the bottom, there is a, a shelf that holds all sorts of shapes and sizes of router bits. And so when you're not using a router bit or when you take one off, so that it doesn't end up on the floor or lost, right? There's a holder right here and you just stick the router bit in there. At some point we can come pick them up and put them in the cabinet, but um, having the router bits right here is very handy when you need one. Another piece that you would find on here are a variety of boards that would look like this, right? And so, there is no one shape fits all for a push stick on a router table or a pusher block. Um, so this is a push device that we use on the router table and most of the router tables will have something hanging on it that is a push device, right? And again, uh, there, this, it's hard to give you a specific shape because they all look a little different and it really depends on what is the task that we're trying to accomplish. But there's a push device that hangs here. Now another piece that you would often see on a tool panel would be something like this. This is a, uh, a stop block and so I'll show you a setup that we use in class in a few minutes where we need stop blocks. We want to start and stop the movement of our piece of wood using a stop block. That is going to help eliminate error, right? If I have a start point and I cannot, I cannot get away from that start point, I'm less likely to end up with an error. And then I move my piece across the router bit and when I come to the stop block, that's as far as I can go. I'm much less likely to end up with a mistake or with an error. Uh, and so start and stop blocks on a router table are really, really helpful. Now another piece that we often see and will use with a router is a fixture or a jig, right? So this is a jig or fixture. Those two words are synonymous. Um, it just depends on how you learned them, a jig or a fixture. And the jig or a fixture, the purpose of this is to keep my hands safely away from what's being routed and the router bit. So here is a leg for a craftsman style table or a craftsman style box, like a jewelry box. But look at the size of that leg. It's a tiny little leg and it's got a giant slot in it cut by a, with a slot cutter, a flywheel, and that is for a biscuit. Well, to try to cut that with my fingers is, is going to be almost impossible without badly getting hurt. So I need another way to be able to stick that piece of wood up against the router bed. Well, the easiest way, the safest way to do that is to create a fixture that holds it exactly where it's supposed to be held. And now I can keep my fingers way back from the blade. I can route it and I'm good to go. All right, well now let's take a look up on top of the machine so we can see how all these parts and pieces that we just looked at on the tool panel get put to use. All right, well let's start by looking here at this store-bought model. This is from a company named Rockler and this is a store-bought router table. So it comes with some uh, nice features. You can duplicate these features at home uh, if you build your own router table, it does require having a few um, special router bits and things like that. This table insert that you see here does a few special things that you'd have to order. This is about probably about $200 for this little insert right here. But what it does is it holds the router and it raises and lowers the router bit with the little crank handle. And that's a great feature. Uh, is it worth the $200 for a home model? Uh, I guess you have to become a wood chopper and uh, figure that out for yourself if you think it's worth it. But it is a nice feature to have uh, so that we're not having to reach underneath and mess with the router down there. 
So on our router, here is the route where the router sticks through the table, right? I've got a, a router bit on there. The router is attached underneath, okay? And so that's the first thing. The first thing I wanna do is I wanna close up this hole once I get the proper router bit in here. So I'm gonna reach over to the side, I'm gonna grab my throat plate, right? Again, we've seen multiple machines where we have a throat plate to close up the hole on the tabletop. I'm gonna put that in there. The next thing I need is my clear plastic wrench. That's gonna, uh, right? Remember this throw plate doesn't just rest in there like some of the other ones do. This threads in like a screw or like a bolt. That keeps it from vibrating and coming out and getting thrown or just destroyed by the router bit. So I'm gonna go like that, tighten it into place. Now I'm gonna remove the wrench and hang it back over here. Now, I also need to adjust the height. That's another, right? Getting the right router bit and then adjusting the height is another piece. So for that, I need this crank handle. The crank handle goes right here in the front of this and I'm gonna turn it and adjust it one way or the other until it's exactly the right height. Now I may need to just practice on the piece of wood that I'm gonna be working with until I know that it's exactly where I want it to be. Once I get it to the right height, I'm gonna remove the crank handle, put it back over here on the tool panel. The next thing I have on most router bits or on most router tables is a fence, right? Notice that we got a fence here and that fence can be adjusted. I've got a couple of knobs back here. These are the fence lock knobs and that's gonna allow me to adjust the fence forward or backwards depending on what it is I need to do. Once I get the fence to the correct location, then I'm gonna tighten up those locking no knobs so that the fence now is locked onto the tabletop. Um, now on specialty cuts and, and cuts where I have a curved edge, I'm gonna have to have the router bit sticking out in front. But as much as if I can bury the router bit back in the fence, I'm less likely to get cut by it. Once I have the right height and I have the fence in the right location, my next job is to put the safety guard on. Remember, that's really the reason that we wanna use a router table is because it allows me to use a safety guard. These, all of our fences here, right? On some fences, if you make them at home, you may have to clamp your safety guard onto your fence. Here, because we made them in the shop, um, the fence has this little groove in it. The fence has a, a groove cut in it with a router bit. That router bit groove accepts uh, a, a special little uh, T-nut that fits in it. So here, and then we have little tightening knobs on the, the guard. So now I put my f guard in place and then I tighten it all up. And that is going to go a long way at keeping my hands out of that blade. Now, as you can see on this side, I have a start block. So this particular guard has been cut exactly the, the width that of the cut. So now I take my um, stop block on the left side and I slide it up against my guard. And then I clamp the, I clamp the stop block into place there with my F clamps. And I'm ready to uh, I'm ready to route. That's that's really my setup. Now this particular setup is intended to use with a fixture, right? So now that's gonna allow me, that's what this big opening on the top is for. It allows me to go in with a fixture, across with a fixture, and back out. Well, here is a classroom-made variety of router table. All of the same principles really are going to apply here to the process of routing. Um, so here's a, a classroom-made fence, but we did put a groove in it so the same guard that fits in uh, the machine made or the store-bought router table fits here. Here's the T-nut on the back and those just slide in this groove. You bring it over, cover up your router bit, and tighten the guard 
in place. The classroom built uh, router table doesn't have the fence lock nuts in the back. It just uses an F clamp to lock our fence onto our table. So I'm going to adjust my fence to wherever it needs to be and then I simply lock it down onto the table with an F clamp. Um, there's no raising and lowering hole here, so we don't have an insert on this one. So the way I'm going to raise my router um, on this particular table <clears throat> is that I'm, I'm going to loosen a latch underneath here and I rotate. There's a, uh, the motor of the router. If I just rotate the motor in the router, I'll see the router bit come up. How do I change the router bit? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it to the left until that router motor comes out. Now, I need to change the router bit, so I want to come down here, follow the cord down, and unplug it. I always, anytime I'm going to put wrenches or put my fingers where the router bit is, I need to get it unplugged, so there's no possible way it could accidentally come on while I am working on it. Hanging on the side of the router table on the, the tool panel are some wrenches. And to change my router bit here, I'm going to put the top wrench in my left hand and just squeeze my two hands together. That loosens that lock nut. And the router bit comes out. Now, again, over here on my tool panel, I'm going to come over here and find a different router bit. And then I'm going to take that router bit and I'm going to put that in my router. Then I'm going to tighten up the lock nuts. This time I'm going to put the top wrench in my right hand. Put my hands together and just put the wrenches in my hand and squeeze together. There's the router bit. So I've changed the router bit in that router. Again, the router is unplugged while I do that. Now I'm going to take that I'm going to put it back in the base of the router. The base of the router is the thing that is screwed to the top of the table. And I just start rotating the router and now the router bit pops back up through the top of the table again. All right, well let's take a second and look inside here and see how do we mount a router in a router table. It's fairly simple. We're just going to take the router. We're going to mount the base upside down into the router table. We screw it in there. So here's what the base of a router looks like, right? A handheld router. When you use a handheld router, this base is the surface that runs on the surface of the board, right? The base is going to have some sort of locking device or latching device, right? Some have a bolt, thumb screw, right? Like that, that will light, loosen or tighten. The more modern version is just a latch, which is the one you see in here. Right here is the latch. If I take that latch and push it back and open it up, it has now released this bottom part. This is the motor and the motor is where we attach the router bit. Now this base, you can see here, this base has four screws in it. If I take these screws out, right, one, two, three, and four, if I take those screws out, put this in the router table and then return the screws back in through the surface of the router table up there, this base is now attached to the router table. Then I'm going to take the, the motor and I'm just going to, the motor actually kind of locks in here like a thread. Like I just, you'll notice as I raise or lower the motor, I'm just going to twist it like I was twisting a screw or a nut or a bolt and it'll either raise up, that's how it goes in, or it comes back out and it lowers. So I've released the latch in here on the base. You can see the base is attached up to the surface. And then as I rotate that, it comes out. There's the motor. There's the motor. And then to the motor, I attach the different router bits. Once I have the new router bit put in there, again, with the latch in here released, and with the router unplugged, I simply put the router motor back in there, 
and then I'm going to start turning and I can feel it catch and then it will start to raise up there it goes it'll start to raise up in there now at this point I'm going to now need to look up here on top because now I'm going to adjust the height of the router bit so let's move up a little bit and we'll look at that well there's the router bit right up here on the tabletop now as I adjust this by rotating it like you saw me do earlier, I can adjust the height of the router bit. And so now I need to determine, well, how much do I want to cut off? On most big router bits, I do not want to cut one pass. I want to put part of the router bit above the table, lock it, route, and then I'm going to raise it up a little bit more. Most router bits, big ones, I want two to three passes to get all of that cut off. Otherwise, I, I'm in danger of splitting and cracking and chipping the edge of the board, making a mess of it. All right, and once I get here, I just return that latch to the closed position, and there we are. We've got our router bit now set up on the table, and it's ready to route. As in all the other machines that we've seen, the router also has an on and off switch. Now, there's actually two switches here. There's a switch on the router itself. That switch typically stays in the on position. What you see here is this little box. So this little box is an add-on switch, and it gives us a couple of things that we can do. This little dial in the middle allows us to adjust the speed if we want to, right? So I can turn the router up really high, I could turn it down really slow. The on and off switch right here allows me to either adjust the speed myself or it takes that control away from me and just turns it on as fast as it can go. And in most cases, we're just going to turn it on as fast as it can go. So the box, although it's a little beat up here after wear, the, the green side is full speed. The red side is variable speed. The, the switch actually goes in the middle to be off. And then if I turn it to the green side, it's going to go on full. And if I turn it to the red side, it goes on variable speed. Now, when I'm gonna go ahead and use the router, now that I've got everything adjusted, I've put a router bit in, and I'm ready to start routing, the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug this back in. Right, I unplugged it earlier so I could do all of my adjusting, so I could change my router bit. Now that that's done, I wanna plug that back in. Yep, we're back on. Now that's full speed. That's variable speed. Well, let's take a second and look at a router bit close up. So here is a router bit that we would use on any router. Uh, a router bit is made up of the metal part, generally it's painted, right? That supports the blades. The blades on most of the router bits that we use here at the school are carbide. So the carbide is a separate substance that's welded on to the steel blade. You can buy high-speed steel blades, all one piece, no, nothing welded on, and they work okay. They're going to dull faster. You're going you're gonna to dull them faster, but they still could work. The router bits that you generally see here in the shop are generally a color. The metal, the steel has been painted. Then there's a silver part. That's the carbide that has been added on. Carbide is very sharp. It'll stay sharp longer, but it's brittle. If you drop it, you're gonna chip pieces of carbide off and then now that router bit's not gonna make a very good cut for you anymore. Notice on top, this is the really key part to the router bits that we use here. These are guided by a bearing, right? These are bearing guided router bits. So that bearing is a wheel that can come off of there, right? So there is the little wheel right and that little wheel rolls along your board right no matter even if it's a right that wheel rolls along and even if it was a circle right that wheel just rolls along the edge of the circle and it cuts a beautiful detail all the way around so this is critical this little wheel uh, Whenever I go to use a router bit, that's one of the first things I look for is to make sure that little wheel is attached. The little wheel is just screwed in there with a screw. So every now and then, because of all the wear and tear, that screw comes loose and comes off. The wheel flies off of there while it's spinning and 
that creates a big problem with this router bit. If I try to use a router bit that's missing that wheel, I could be in big trouble. I could ruin my project. So I always want to start by looking at that, make sure the wheel is on there, make sure the wheel spins freely. That's going to keep from damaging the edge of your project. Next, I want to look at the carbide blade and make sure that still looks sharp, no damage to that. Okay. When I am raising and lowering my router bit over here, I want the colored part sticking up above the table. Never, never, never should the colored part be up above the table and some of the shank of the, of the uh, router bit be exposed, right? Only the colored router head should be sticking up above the table and generally not that much on a giant router bit. This is a, this is a example bit that was made on a lathe but this is a reasonable size, right? There are router bits this big. Um, you never would want to cut that whole entire router bit at one pass. You would always do router bits that are big like this in multiple passes, probably three for a, a router bit this size. If I have a tiny router bit, I probably do that in one pass, but giant router bits like this, I want that router bit to cut in three passes. Now I mentioned the word call it. So here, here is a collet. The collet screws onto the top of the router motor. This is what receives the router bit shank. So there are two different size router bit shanks. Here's one with a half inch shank. Here's one with a quarter inch shank. You can see two very different sizes. In order for these to be put into the router, I have to have a collet that matches the same side. That hole has to match the size of the shank. So there are half inch shanks that fits. And then there's quarter inch shanks. The one that's in this router right now is the quarter inch shank. So we need to also get familiar when we work with a router, we need to get familiar with this thing called a collet because this is what locks the router bit into the router itself. When I wanna loosen or tighten this nut to put my router bit in, I need to have the two um, wrenches, right? The two wrenches. So every router will come with two wrenches that allow me to loosen and tighten those collet nuts so that I can lock the router bit into the, the router. I now have my router table set up. I've got my guard put in place, my fence is adjusted correctly, my throat blade's been put in there, and I have my start and stop block clamped to the fence as well. The last thing I need to do is simply lock my piece of wood into the, the fixture that I'm gonna use here. And then I can go ahead and route. Now, again, I need to remember, when I work on a router table, I always move from right to left, so I'm gonna start on this side, this is the end feed side. I'm gonna start, push in on the right, move across towards the left, and then pull the piece back out. That turned out pretty good. Now, when I make this leg for the Craftsman style box, I have to ride, route each leg twice. So now I'm gonna take that leg, I rotate it around. I'm gonna put it back in the fixture and do it one more time. Well, so there you see the, the use of a fixture with the aids on a routing table to really safely route uh, a, a fairly small piece. And I do hundreds of these right every year when we make the Craftsman style box. And we can safely route over and over again, get the same outcome on every single, uh, every single leg. And we do it very safely. All right, well that's the look at this big store-bought router table. Now let's look at a shop built router table. So I'm ready to route now on my router table. We've talked about the fact that there's two ways to route. 
I'm gonna route both of them here so you can see how I do that. To start with, I'm gonna route the straight flat edge of my board. So my initial setup is just to make sure that the face of the fence is flush with the face or, or it's flush with the face of the wheel or tangent to the little bearing wheel. That looks pretty good. So I tighten my fence into place and I'm ready to route. I'm gonna go ahead and bring my guard over. Remember, I never use a, a router without a guard unless I've asked for permission to remove it. And that's really my setup. Now I wanna take into consideration a couple of other um, safety items, right? Remember, I always, before I start working, safety is number one importance. So I noticed that I have some lanyards. This could be jewelry, right? It could be I might even consider that long hair, right? All of that kind of stuff needs to be addressed first. So I'm gonna tuck my, my uh, lanyard or my jewelry down inside my shirt where it cannot swing out and get caught up in the router bit. Um, number two, I need to make sure that I have on eye protection. I've got glasses on whenever I work with any of these machines. And lastly, in the case of a router, the router tends to be pretty loud. It's louder than a sander, it's louder than a bandsaw. So, I'm just going to go ahead and wear ear protection as well. And now I'm ready to route. So we mentioned earlier, make sure you turn the router on full speed unless you have another reason not to do that, to put it on variable speed. pretty good now the router is not a one pass and you're done machine you really need to route it and look at it if it's done correctly and it looks like what it's supposed to then you're done but it could take 10 passes to get it to that point sometimes the piece of wood is not perfectly flat and so after you route it you realize that part right there that needed routing was lifting off the table as I went by um, sometimes you don't push hard enough back towards the router bit and down to the tabletop so we, a, a good thing to remember is that routing is not a one pass and you're done. You, you really need to do as many passes as it takes to get it correct. Human error creates a lot of the problem and so I have to keep going back and overcoming the things that I didn't catch as I was pushing it across. So in this case, this looks good, that's fine, I'm done. Now I want to route a irregular shape, right? So that's a curve. Now I need to push the fence back, right? I can't route an irregular curve with the router bit buried in the fence. So I'm gonna have to push it back and I wanna push it back just far enough that I can route, but I wanna keep it close enough that my guard will sit over the router bit if possible. So that right there looks pretty good. I should be able to access my, my curves with the router bearing, but but I'm able to uh, get every part of the, the curve, plus I've kept it far enough forward that I can keep the, the uh, guard covering the board. Now, remember, here's where this gets difficult um, because I'm, I've got to put the piece of wood up against the spinning router bit and it's not buried in the fence. Bringing the board into contact with the router bit is the most dangerous point of all routing. Uh, if it's buried in the router bit and I'm doing a straight piece of wood, no problem. But when I do irregular shapes and I have to bring my board directly up against the spinning router bit, extremely dangerous. So for that, we're gonna introduce a, uh, a starting pin. And a starting pin simply is a piece that fits into a hole on the tabletop. And I'm gonna be able to put my piece of wood up against the starting pin and rotate it into the rotating blade. That way, if the blade wants to throw the board backwards that way, it can't go backwards. It's sitting against a pin which is stuck into the tabletop. That gets the board up against the router bit. I'm gonna make a little bit of a cut and then I'm gonna stop and take the pin out and finish my cut 
and I'm perfectly safe. The issue is the moment of contact. That is one of the most dangerous parts of routing. So here we go. I've got my starting pin in. nice decorative detail all the way around both edges of my stock. Now I'm ready to take this and put it into my project. Well I hope you've enjoyed getting to see the router table. It's, it's a very complicated, it's one of the most complicated of all the machines to set up. There's lots and lots of parts, there's a lot of setup uh, every time I go to put a new router bit in. It's a, it's a very complex setup so obviously you can see the radio took a little bit longer than the others because there's a lot to talk about. But the router is a indispensable tool in the shop. I mean, almost any project I look around on the wall and see, I can see traces of routing, right? Routing has been done to it. So it's a, it's a tool you can't get away from. And now you know how to use it and how to use it safely. All right, well, we'll see you next time as we look at another tool in our machine of the day.